the Christmas weekend, uh, all through Christmas Day, and making sure that we are continuing to be vigilant as we address this pandemic. I'm joined today by our Health Commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, who will be presenting some additional information, as well as our Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services Commissioner, Jackie Bray, who was on the front lines in New York City dealing with the, the first wave of the pandemic. So what I have to acknowledge is that the numbers are continuing to climb. This has not been a surprise to us, particularly since we started taking precautions, warning about the winter surge as early as early October, taking a major step with an executive order on November 26th, around the holidays of Thanksgiving, and also knowing full well that this could be a very vulnerable time, given how, how quickly this mutation, Omicron, transmits. And so, again, not March of 2020, we have tools at our disposal, and it's, the question is how we're deploying them, and I think people will be very confident, I know people will be very confident in how we've done that. So we're continuing to work on our, our winter surge plan, making more testing available, and reminding everyone we have ordered and have, uh, are starting to receive 37 million testing kits, which are critically important to make sure that people can ensure that they're safe before they gather with individuals or go to their jobs. So that's important to make sure that that testing is widely available. So let's take a minute and go through some of the latest numbers. Positive cases, uh, we had a low number on the 26th because there's usually less on Sunday, so I don't want to get too much excitement around uh, 26,737. We did have 36,000 positives on, on Christmas Day, but uh, our numbers, again, are a little bit off. We'll have a, a full number, more accurate numbers tomorrow once we calculate in the, uh, the reduced testing over the weekend. So we did administer tests, uh, 168,000 tests. That's just down slightly from 257. We did literally on Christmas, uh, so we are, we are looking at different numbers just because of the holidays. A lot of people are getting tested around the holidays. We're grateful for that. You answered our call to make sure that you're safe before you traveled, before you had your dinners. And uh, also, I just remind everybody, we have seen a major uptick in cases all around us. This is a northeastern phenomenon right now, uh, Washington on up, the, north, uh, the uh, Atlantic seaboard, New Jersey, all around us, uh, Rhode Island, Delaware, Maryland, are all being hit hard, uh, almost equal numbers as we are. So we are seeing uh, cases per 100,000 uh, statewide up to 180, which is high. You can see where we're trending there. Not a surprise, not something we weren't preparing for, not something we're not ready for, but it is always disturbing to see those numbers continue as they do. Uh, hospitalizations, this is what we focus on. Over the, over the last two days, on average, about 165 deaths a day, 132 total over two days. Our herds data was off on Christmas, so we don't want to give you an inaccurate number. But anyhow, this is just a devastating time to lose a loved one over the holidays. And you read, read the reports in the newspaper, individuals who literally had 48 hours notice when their loved one first contracted the virus and then succumbed to it. And, and I just can't imagine the pain that these families are going through. So let's always keep them in our prayers. We had 5,526 New Yorkers hospitalized yesterday. We had 7,183 hospitalized this very day last year. You can see, though, the hospitalizations are continuing to spike upward. You get some comfort in seeing we're not where we were in April 2020. We're not where we were in January of 2021. But it is going upwards, and that is something that we are very cognizant of and have been anticipating and preparing for. So some of our hospital actions, as you know, we've been laser focused on this. We warned about this. We've taken major action to increase bed capacity and also protect critical services as part of our winter surge plan. And it's been working right now. We required hospitals to scale up their capacity. This was not done this week or even last week. This was talked about at the end of October and through November. So we did pause uh, non-essential elective surgeries in hospitals with limited capacity, which we defined as having 10% or less uh, capacity at the time. Some have rolled off, some have gone back on. So right now we still average about, uh, I think it's about 25 are on that list, uh, down from 32. We've made it easy for hospitals to bring in additional workers, activating their surge and flex plans. As I mentioned, we signed that executive order to suspend uh, elective surgeries, working with staff to, uh, working with hospitals to get more staff in. The communication with individual hospitals is ongoing, it's intense, being very responsive to their needs and being as helpful as we can. As you know, in some cases, we even deployed the National Guard to help with their discharges. 
again, knowing that there are people who could be discharged from hospitals, but were not able to be taken by a long tier facility or by a nursing home. So we deployed the National Guard to those facilities to take some of the pressure off. So this continues intensely ramping up, but it, this has already been in place. And what we've seen, as I just mentioned, we've seen a, an increase in our bed capacity, which is good, something we've been working on, an 8% increase in our hospital bed capacity. I'm not going to rest on our laurels here because this could change in a moment's notice. So this is just a, 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 a snapshot of where we are right now. But I do thank the hospitals who've uh, made progress in getting us down to 25 who are, we're in, uh, working closely with. We are preparing our strategy, which we'll be announcing later this week, for our winter surge 2.0. So uh, those of you who want to join me on New Year's Eve, I'll be anticipating being right here. Um, we'll bring some festivities and make it a little more fun than it probably would ordinarily be, but this is where I'll be New Year's Eve. Uh, we're preparing for all scenarios, including the worst case scenarios, which we're not at, but I have said from the very beginning, I want to have the ability to deploy whatever actions need to be taken if we get to a crisis situation, and we are not there yet, but I'm going to be continuing everything we do. In fact, I'll be speaking with President Biden when he addresses other uh, U.S. governors and another half an hour or so, 45 minutes, I'll be on that call with President Biden. And I spoke with him separately last week before he did his national um, press conference. And I will be talking, uh, Commissioner Bray will be giving an update on what our specific asks are to the federal government and how we're having to rely on them for some of the work, but also we are everything we have control over, we're handling here. And that means vaccines and boosters. We've had more than 3.2 million vaccines administered just since December 1st. Uh, doses over 33 million just since uh, as, of, as of 11 a.m. yesterday. 4.3 million booster shots, and you see the gap. We are very excited to hit the 90% of one dose. That is very high. We're proud of that. But this gap between the one dose and the fully vaccinated is still too large, 82.3. There is a lagging number because there's a little time between the first dose and the second dose, but we should be catching up with that. So. I'm urging everybody, if you had the one dose, be aware you're on a process, you're a step on a process, you're not there yet, you're not protected, particularly against Omicron, which is just breaking through in some case to people who are vaccinated, that's why you need to get to the booster stage. With respect to our young people, parents, I'm calling on you, this is the time you have the kids home from school. There's plenty of vaccination opportunities from your pediatrician to a site set up by the state of New York, uh, our urgent care centers, so many places, drugstores, where you can go get your child vaccinated before they get back to school. Please do this for them. We've, now we know that uh, children 11 to four, uh, I'm sorry, five to 11 year olds, using this time to get this done is really smart. And children five to 11 have been approved since November 3rd. So we're almost have up to th two solid months We've had this opportunity to get children during that age category, in that age category, vaccine. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Bassett to address this in a couple of minutes as well. Here's our numbers we just talked about. The, uh, we're going up with the 5 to 11 year olds. Um, two weeks ago, we were at 11%, but we're just not where we need to go today. We're at 16.4%. So we're going up, trending upward, but there's just no reason we have the supply, we have the capacity, we have the staff in place for every child to be vaccinated who's eligible. I'll be talking about that shortly. So uh, also concerned about pediatric admissions, and I want Dr. Bassett to speak in particular about what we're seeing and some information she released on Friday. Uh, Dr. Bassett? Uh, thanks very much, Governor. So on Friday, the health department released a communication to uh, health workers, principally pediatricians, uh, called a health alert. And it pointed out that we'd observed an uptick in pediatric admissions, uh, concentrated in the New York City area, where there was an increase of about fourfold. Uh, in those data reported on Friday, uh, among the children who are aged five to 11, uh, none had been vaccinated. Uh, although, as you saw in the, in the governor's uh, slide just now, uh, in this group, we have about 27% have received at least one dose. In this group that was hospitalized, none had been vaccinated, and then the older group, uh, about a quarter had been vaccinated, even though uh, in the general population we are up 
to 75% having received at least one dose. The data that you see in the slide here are more complete than the data that we released on Friday, and they show admissions for uh, between the ages of zero and 18. Uh, you can see from these data that beginning from the week of December 5th to 11th, when there were statewide 70 pediatric admissions, uh, we've gone up two and a half fold, uh, but New York City has gone up nearly five fold uh, up to the week uh, of uh, December 19th, uh, not a complete week. Uh, we'll update those data later. We're releasing these data because we want pediatricians to be alert to making the diagnosis of COVID in children. Uh, and we also want parents to be alert to the diagnosis. Many people thought, uh, continue to think that children don't become infected with COVID. This is not true. Children become infected and some will be hospitalized. Uh, the immunization coverage in this group, the vaccination coverage remains too low. And that's the second reason that we released these data uh, to alert people to the fact that we need to get child vaccinations up. Uh, we need to get them higher than they are particularly in the five to 11 year old age group. And pediatricians can play a role in this, advising parents, and parents can play a role in this, understanding that their children may become infected and may become sick. Additionally, uh, we released on Friday, new guidance on isolation for people who've been found to be uh, infected with COVID. As you're aware, you've seen the numbers uh, uh, the last, probably truly accurate figure that we had was up to nearly 50,000 uh, new infections. Um, we know that the testing went down over the holiday weekend and uh, possibly reporting of those tests as well. So we know that there are many, many people who are infected. Uh, we um, released this guidance the day after the Centers of Disease Control released its guidance update. Ours differed in some ways from the Centers of Disease Control. Uh, I want to outline to you what the New York State guidance does and, uh, and then uh, point out the ways in which it builds on the Centers for Disease Control guidance. Uh, this um, covers, the New York State guidance covers only people who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, the return to work <clears throat> after a shortened isolation is available only to people who've been fully vaccinated. Additionally, these are people who test positive <clears throat> or who have very minor symptoms, uh, whose symptoms are resolving uh, and have not had a fever uh, for 72 hours. Uh, they will uh, wear a mask on return to work, uh, and it should be a high-quality, well-fitting mask, uh, meaning not a cloth mask. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control uh, has, uh, has guidance that applies only to health workers. Uh, their guidance applies to all uh, workers who test positive regardless of their vaccination status. Uh, our guidance is uh, analogous to the Centers for Disease Control guidance for what they call contingency conditions. That's when contingency measures are being put in place to protect the healthcare uh, uh, capacity. That is currently going on in New York State. Uh, we allow people to return to work after five days of isolation without testing. Testing is not required, and this is consistent with the Centers for Disease Control guidance for contingency. Um, so the key way that we differ is limiting this to uh, people who have been fully vaccinated and extending the, uh, the shortened isolation guidance beyond health workers to include other critical workforce participants. Um, uh, so I just want to be really clear that this is not about sending people back to work who are sick. Having symptoms is probably uh, your best test. People who are sick in all times should not be at work. And in these times in particular, people who are sick should not go to work. This guidance is for people who either have no symptoms or very mild symptoms that are, uh, that are resolving. Uh, I thought I would also say a word about nursing homes uh, before moving on to the next slide, I apologize. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, two, 608 nursing homes across the state. 
Uh, we're currently seeing about a third of those nursing homes with at least one uh, resident who has COVID infection. Uh, we have done pretty well in getting uh, the nursing home residents vaccinated. Nearly 90% are fully vaccinated, but we're not doing as well as we would like in getting people boosted. And this seems to be particularly important in protecting against adverse outcomes of Omicron infection. When we do the math, about two thirds of nursing home residents have been fully vaccinated and boosted. Uh, we're working hard to get that number up. We're doing it by focusing in a very granular way, county by county, uh, and uh, looking at the local health department uh, activities. Uh, Commissioner Bray is working with county executives. Uh, and so we're going down to the data, nursing home by nursing home, to get these most vulnerable people of our population uh, fully protected with boosters. The, uh, the facts are clear. Uh, we know that three quarters of the lives we've lost in this pandemic have been among people who are over 65. So being fully vaccinated and boosted is critical in this very vulnerable population of nursing home residents. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Bassett, for the reminder about nursing homes. As you uh, spoke about, we have been very aggressive in providing the booster shots to our nursing home population. But again, you cannot get a booster unless you've been vaccinated. And we've been trying to, ever since we required all nursing homes to make boosters available back around Thanksgiving, and if they had been successful, we wouldn't even have a problem right now. But they did their best efforts, and we're continuing to touch base with them. And uh, Jackie Bray, our commissioner, will be talking about that a little bit. But finding out that there are barriers where uh, someone has dementia and cannot uh, 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 consent, knowingly consent to getting a vaccination or a booster shot, or if family members decline the opportunity to get approvals for them. And that is the only reason we're seeing barriers right now. It's not access, it's not availability, it's not the fact that they weren't uh, required to bring boosters to the nursing homes. But it's an area we wanna continue focusing on and we'd love to get those numbers up even higher. Uh, we also know that yes, it is a, a break, well not a break for parents, your kids are home and I remember the days very well and all the chaos returns and all the excitement over the holidays but the kids will be going back to school. And all of us agree we have a strong public interest in keeping our kids in school. We went through the social experiment of keeping them isolated and what teachers had to go through and parents and the children was extraordinary. And the results are now showing that they the, the learning did not continue the way it should have that we had hoped it would, as well as the, the emotional effect and the toll it's been taking that is manifesting itself as we see in our young children all the way up to our teenagers now. So, so parents were encouraging to get them vaccinated, your kids vaccinated during the break and school districts encouraging you to do your best efforts to help limit the transmission. And what we're talking about is a, an outreach which has been very intense to all 731 school districts through the boards of education, cooperative education, BOCES as it's known. And we are, been, we've been ordering tests, we've anticipated this day, we want to make sure that we have at least three to three and a half million tests out to our schools, dedicated exclusively for children in schools, and we're working to get those out there. In fact, we are deploying over two million test kits to the city of New York schools, so they can be in hand for the school districts to be able to deploy them the way they choose, whether it's sending them home with children after the first day, whether they can institute testing in school, we will leave that up to them, but it is our responsibility to help them with their uh, amassing the necessary number they require. And that is why we're having uh, 2 million to New York City by Friday and also to have 3.3 million available to the rest of the state. So uh, Commissioner Bray will give more details on that, but that is something that we're deploying our state team to help us out with, and uh, I'll be working and talking about that in a couple of minutes, but we wanna make sure that these schools stay open. As Dr. Bassett said, most cases are not being transmitted in schools. Children are wearing their mask. We want more vaccinated. We want them boosted at some point, as soon as possible, but we understand that it is not a good option to say children are gonna be returning home again subject to possible changes in the future, but right now that is absolutely where our position is. 
it's unwavering on this date with respect to looking at a date of January 3rd, we wanna get the children back to school. We're doing a call with all 500 superintendents. Tomorrow I'll be having conversations with them directly myself in addition to the ongoing conversations that are being conducted by our team. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Bray to give an update on our testing and other operations, and she can give you uh, the real nitty-gritty details of what she has her hands in. So, Commissioner Thank Bray. you, Governor. Thank you. As the Governor said, it's, it's really an all-hands-on-deck operation uh, to keep kids in school, and, and, you know, it's our responsibility to supply uh, as many of our districts as we possibly can so that they can supply as many kids as they possibly can with kits. So I just want to go uh, reiterate some of the numbers. Uh, it's about 6 million tests, 3 million kits that will go out this week. Uh, of that, 2 million tests going directly to New York City. Um, there's 731 endpoints. Those are our districts. Uh, we'll be supplying them through 60 different hubs throughout the state. Uh, those will include the, the BOCES, some direct to school districts, and some county hubs. Planes with these kits begin arriving tomorrow. They will be landing in the state every day this week. We've got over 100 trucks on the roads uh, from warehouse to warehouse uh, to our hubs. Uh, and I wanna thank our uh, state partners, DOT, uh, Corrections, the National Guard, Thruway, Canals, the Port Authority, and of course our team at Homeland Security and Emergency Services that are making this operation this week possible. We'll be prioritizing deliver, delivery based on case rate uh, by district so that we make sure that the kits get uh, to the districts that are seeing the highest level of transmission uh, as early as possible in the week. I also want to remind everyone that that's not the only way that we're expanding access to testing. Uh, pharmacies and urgent cares across the state continue to offer testing, including walk-in testing. Uh, last week, we delivered over a million uh, over-the-counter tests to county local health departments outside of New York City. Last Wednesday and Thursday, we delivered 600,000 over-the-counter tests directly to New York City. We watched as those tests went out to community members and to relieve pressure in the lines in New York City. Any county uh, that wants additional testing sites is able to request staff and supplies from the state, and we've been supplying those as counties step up their work. Um, there are 13 new state sites opening this Wednesday. It won't, those will not be the last of the state sites that open. Those will be the sort of first wave uh, this, this week. Uh, the MTA opened two uh, walk-in testing sites at Times Square and Grand Central. Last week, we expect five more transit hub, te hub testing sites to come online this week. Uh, and, and our over-the-counter orders, our over-the-counter deliveries this week will not be our last. We're gonna be doing rolling deliveries every week, every other week to all of our counties, both to our school districts, but also to communities uh, to make sure that folks are prepared. In addition to our testing, I wanted to give an update on our work with FEMA and the federal government. A FEMA incident management assistant te assistance team arrives today in Albany. They'll be embedding as of 11 a.m. in our emergency operations center. They are helping us secure uh, and, and make good on the asks that we've made for clinical staffing, for additional ambulances, for additional mobile testing teams. Six mobile testing teams arrived last week in New York City. We expect more to be coming from the federal government. The federal government sent 30 ambulances now about 10 days ago uh, to help us relieve transport, uh, transport and transfer pressure uh, in central New York. 10 of those teams were redeployed down to the city uh, on Friday where they remain. Uh, in addition to those resource asks, the governor's been very clear uh, that it's important that New York State uh, receive the monoclonal antibody treatment that continues, the one that continues to work against Omicron, and the oral treatment that Pfizer is uh, preparing and is making available. Obviously, those are on federal allocation, uh, so New York wants to make sure that we get our fair share, but in addition, when they become commercially available, we'll be first in line and ready to make sure that our pharmacies and our hospitals have what they need. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner, and just to make sure there's no confusion when we say million testing kits, there's two 
tests in every kit. So that is 2 million tests are going to the city of New York. But thank you for all the work that you and your team are doing. I know you worked all through the, uh, the Christmas weekend and we appreciate uh, your dedication to the cause. Um, one more note and I'll be traveling a little bit around the state and we'll be announcing uh, where I'll be shortly. But we'll be back here in Albany for New Year's Eve. I'll be here doing a press conference in the afternoon to make sure everyone knows what we're doing to head into the weekend. But here's the last thing we can offer uh, as you're heading into the festivities to wrap up and finally say goodbye to 2021. I remember this time last year, we were so excited to say goodbye to 2020, uh, anticipating that we were also saying goodbye to COVID and the pandemic. And no one could have foreseen that we would be experiencing this one year later, and we're gonna continue to be vigilant. I want all New Yorkers to know that we are, have a very experienced team here. People know what they're doing. They are pulling every single lever available to us, and we're committed to getting this done and doing everything we can to help save lives. But we have power that we just were beginning to untap this time last year when the very first vaccines were becoming available. Now they're widely available. Vaccines are the way we can get through our holidays safely. So if you want to be attending your parties, please make sure that you people are vaccinated and boosted. You wear your mask. Possibly stay outdoors. Uh, it's a little chilly, especially upstate New York, but uh, it'll be worth it when you have a chance to be together with your loved ones and friends this time again next year. So, so talk to all your hosts and your friends and everybody. And if you're sniffling, if you're not feeling good, just stay home, watch the ball drop on television, get a nice glass of champagne, and know that you're doing the smart thing. So, so our New Year's resolution is we'll get through this winter surge together and we'll regather again uh, on the other side of the beginning of 2022. So thank you. And with that, we'll take any questions. I think we want to, okay. Yes, indeed. Governor, good morning. Your first question comes from Andrea Grimes at WCBS. Andrea, your mic is open. Hi, good morning, Governor. I had a question regarding the um, isolation and quarantine guidelines, and maybe the commissioner can also weigh in on this. Um, why not change them for the entire population? If it's safe for this whole group, essential workers and healthcare workers, why is it not safe for everybody else? I will certainly let the commissioner address this because this was part of our conversation, but it's also consistency with, with what had been done in the past. There is a list of critical workers that was already developed in the early months of the pandemic and to make sure that we started this immediately so we could take advantage of what the CDC now recommended, we wanted to at least address that first category, which we did on Friday. However, there's a, we will be examining our other options as well, Dr. Bass, Dr. Bassett. Uh, Governor, I can't really add to that. Uh, I, I just would point out to the questioner that New York State uh, went beyond the Centers for Disease Control, something that we don't do lightly, uh, in extending our guidance on shortened isolation to other sectors than healthcare workers. Uh, so we started with a, a list that had already been developed on essential workers, and uh, as the governor has indicated. And just to put an exclamation point on what Dr. Bassett previously said, we are also making sure that the workers who return are vaccinated. That is not a requirement of, or recommendation from the CDC because they said vaccinated or unvaccinated. And we thought we'd make sure that the, the individuals returning had that extra layer of protection that they would not only go back and wear their masks and be absolutely asymptomatic. And if they have any symptoms, do not go back, but also that they're vaccinated. So, and, and hopefully boosted as well. So, so thank you, Dr. Bass. But you'll be hearing more from the Department of Health as this evolves, but we're looking at it every single day and uh, making the right calculations with the data that's been given to us. Thank you very much, Governor. Your next question comes from Andrew Siff of WNBC. Andrew, your mic is open. Go ahead and open your mic, Andrew. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Andrew. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Governor and Dr. Bassett. Uh, what, what the doctor was saying about the sharp increase in the number of children hospitalized with COVID, including five times the amount in New York City. Are we seeing acute cases? Are they being hospitalized as a precaution because of difficulty breathing? 
because on the, the face of things, hearing about that rise is going to be extremely alarming to a lot of parents today. Let me start out by saying that what I hope parents do is protect their children who are eligible for vaccination by getting them vaccinated. Our vaccination rates in 5 to 11-year-olds remain disappointingly low, uh, and uh, I hope that parents uh, will take advantage of the opportunity to vaccinate their children uh, so that their children are protected. It's clear that vaccination uh, really reduces the chance of severe illness and boosting uh, if you're eligible for it, adds to that. Uh, these uh, numbers that I've given you in the chart reflect both people who were hospitalized uh, with a diagnosis of COVID and those who were found to be COVID positive on hospitalization. It reflects all infections. Beyond that, I can't give you any more details. One more thing I'd like to add to that is we are encouraging the FDA to give approval for children under the age of five to be vaccinated, obviously at a lower dose, but we want to protect this younger population. And also in the meantime, the way you can protect that population is for older siblings to be vaccinated. If you have a, a three-year-old, they cannot be vaccinated. If you have a five-year-old who's interacting with your three-year-old, that five-year-old should be vaccinated in order to protect the younger members of your family as well. Thank you, Governor. Your final Zoom question this morning comes from Laura Nambias from Bloomberg News. Laura, your mic is open. Go ahead and unmute your mic, Laura. Can you hear me? Yes, Laura. Hi, Governor. Um, I, I was curious, is there a set of metrics or a specific threshold of cases or hospitalizations um, that would be the worst case scenario that would warrant school closures? Is there, what, what does that threshold look like? Well, that is something that we're studying on an ongoing basis, but we are not seeing the spike in hospitalizations. Again, for many individuals, the symptoms are mild. If you have children vaccinated and you can now get them boosted, this is the path to be on in order to keep them in school. But we also are concerned about the health of you know, also teachers. Many, many teachers are vaccinated, particularly in New York City, and we appreciate that. So they've done what they can, as well as the pe people who work as the staff in, in schools. So we want to make sure that they're safe. So there's not going to be one number. It's going to be a, a combination of events, looking at hospitalization, uh, the rate of spread. But also, at some point, if we look at what has happened in other countries, and don't have a lot of examples, but starting with South Africa, it was a vertical jump upward and an almost vertical decline. So we're not there yet, but we also know that we want to calibrate the right decisions in terms of educating our kids, keeping them safe, because despite uh, some uptick in pediatric cases, we're not seeing that to be an overwhelming problem at this time. But Dr. Bassett, if you would like to add to, um, there's not a hard, fast number. There's just not a textbook number that is given to people to manage a pandemic. So you go with the best science, the best data, the best judgments you have, and now we have historic experience, historical experience to know what we handled a year ago. We handled many more hospitalizations last year. We have a staffing issue as well, so we're moderating our staffing crisis. We also have, with respect to this variant, history of what happened in other countries and how it went up and then came down. But Dr. Bassett, I'd welcome you to uh, participate in that conversation. Sure. Thank you, Governor. Uh, just to add to this, that a, a top priority is keeping children in school. Uh, that's what the test to say uh, policy is designed to enhance. And we understand now the huge costs of having children's education disrupted uh, in terms of their socialization, their mental health, as well as their uh, progression educationally. So uh, the, the goal is to keep children in school and to do it safely. And that's why you heard outlined uh, the greatly increased capacity to offer testing to families that Commissioner Bray and the governor have both outlined. Uh, and this has to be done on a granular basis, looking at each community and its schools. Uh, this is why uh, fitting the policy to the circumstances is so important. We are a long way uh, from the type of, uh, of uh, tsunami 
that was experienced. And we have no indication from the experience internationally that we're going there. This is a highly contagious virus, but it doesn't cause, uh, uh, it's clear at this point that it doesn't cause a severe illness. The risk to our hospital system is simply the numbers. If we have huge numbers of people infected, even a fraction, a small fraction of a big number can be a big number. Uh, and uh, the numbers that we gave on pediatric admissions weren't intended to make it seem that children were having, um, you know, having a, uh, a, an epidemic of infection. These were small numbers that we reported in our health alert. Uh, there, that was based on 50 hospitalizations, and I've now given you some larger numbers, but they're still uh, small numbers. It really is to motivate pediatricians and families to seek the protection of vaccination, a protection both for the vaccinated child and the unvaccinated child and their family. Um, I think I'm just repeating what you've said already, Governor, uh, but um, uh, it, it really is... Uh, we really are uh, a long way uh, from, um, from the kind of experiences that Commissioner Bray witnessed in New York City in the first wave. Thank you for clarifying that. You're absolutely right about this. You know, this is not a time of panic, but we just want to reassure all New Yorkers that we have a, our hand on the pulse of what's going on minute by minute, and we're calibrating our responses accordingly. Question for you about MTA, uh, the MTA. We've seen some crew shortages in the last several weeks. Uh, have you given any sort of consideration to requiring vaccination or even requiring a, a booster for MTA employees? MTA employees are not in close contact with the public. If you look at the roles they play, and we did examine this, and we've offered a vaccination or test option like other state workers. We have 80% of MTA workers are already vaccinated, which is, I don't believe that's been reported, but 80% are already vaccinated. So our concern, as you mentioned, shortages of crews, the individuals who will not want to participate in a mandatory vaccination program will be individuals who would exacerbate that, that problem. We do not want to make it impossible for the New York City workforce to have the proper the, the transportation channels that they're accustomed to. So a calculation has been made. Again, these are not uh, black and white questions always, but we have to make the decision that 80% of people who do not come in contact with other people who wear masks every single day, we've not seen a spike or any kind of spread related to these individuals. In the meantime, we cannot do anything that's going to create a dynamic where there are no trains picking people up for their jobs in the morning or getting health care workers to their jobs in hospitals. So that's the calibration that I keep referring to, and we'll, we're going to stay with the plan we have right now. Couldn't you make the same argument for health care workers, though, that, that you could potentially exacerbate a shortage by a vaccine mandate, and that is one that you haven't? Well, the extreme difference is that the contact of a healthcare worker. When you go into a hospital and you're very sick and you're vulnerable, and if you are encountering a healthcare worker, a nurse or an aide, an orderly, who also has COVID because they, don't, they wouldn't get vaccinated, we've just now set the healthcare system on fire. That is what I prevented with a decision that was not easy to make, but I sleep well at night having made that decision to know that the people in close contact are healthcare workers and I applaud them for doing the right thing. I applaud them, I honor them for what they do today and they're exhausted. They're, they've, they're fed up with the people who will not get vaccinated who are now filling their corridors and creating undue pressure. So huge difference in the exposure, MTA workers, the people who drive the buses are isolated if you're operating a train, you're isolated. Even a toll collector is isolated. We did this calculation on examining exactly how much exposure there would be to the public, and we were satisfied with our decision. Governor, you've, uh, you've uh, talked about uh, allowing lawmakers to meet remotely for, for a few weeks. When do you sort of make a decision about state workers potentially staying home, or do you think that, that where we are right now is okay? And um, do you plan to keep the capital open um, to the public for, for a second? 
Well, right now, what I granted the authority for the legislature to do is to con conduct the option for them to conduct their business remotely until January 15th. And this is when a lot of our requirements, you know, the, uh, the mask or vax mandate also is being assessed. So I would say everything will be assessed at that time. Again, uh, we are hopeful, but not, cannot make any guarantees that the trend of this variant will be the spike up, which we hope starts dropping down soon. And then by the 15th, we'll start seeing some improvements. But if we don't, we'll be willing to extend these and making sure that we keep uh, the, the capital safe and making sure that our legislators conduct their business, but in a safe way as well. So it's evolving. All, the answer I'm going to give you is it's still evolving, but we're looking at that deadline for uh, a possible renewal of other requirements or a cessation of them, depending on the circumstances. Okay, last question for you. Governor, the utility moratorium expired last Tuesday. With the numbers climbing, have you thought about re-extending it, or have we gotten to a point where it's just time for people to start paying their bills? Well, what we're seeing, and this is a result of our effort to make sure that we don't stop the economy as happened in 2020. You know, we still have opportunities for people to go to their jobs. Some are working remotely, but others, the workers, we, we passed a law, the HERO Act, to make sure that workplaces are safe for people to return to. And with the high rate of vaccination, again, 95% of adults over 18 are vaccinated. We need them to continue on the path and get the second one and get the third one, but we are far better off than we were in the past. So it is our strong desire to continue people coming into the workplace in a safe, in a safe manner. And that's, that's what our policies have been geared toward. Not looking to do shutdowns, not looking to disrupt the economy, not looking to have any setbacks. However, I'll always reserve the right to take a different action if circumstances warrant that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming out, and uh, we'll see those of you who choose New Year's Eve. Bring your uh, balloons and champagne and confetti, whatever you like to celebrate here with me in Albany. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.